So bismillah walhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala sayyidil mursaleen muhammadin al amin amma ba'd. So today is our third uh, in the series of discussing about, you know, history from an Islamic perspective and how it's unfolding and what that has to do um, with the ideas out there, the different philosophies. And what does that mean uh, in terms of, from an, I guess, from an Islamic perspective, what is that? What is the unfolding of history and different ideas? How do they all come together? So we're trying to give a, guess, a, a type of framework to history from a Quranic point of view. And uh, so we discussed some basic things, but now today is really where a lot of the, I guess, meat of the discussion everything before this was preliminary in a sense preliminary um forgive me i have dyslexia so sometimes i say words a little bit wrong but that's okay inshallah khair. so uh i think we're going to start with prophet muhammad and prophet musa the tamsil between the two the similarity between the two mm -hmm. and uh by the way just for people that are listening and maybe thinking about why are we going to do this? Of course, the Quran mentions the tamsil of Adam and uh, Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam. So it's, uh, you know, and there's this thing called the ring composition, right? Things begin and end in a similar fashion. So you have Adam to Isa in a sense. And uh, <clears throat> so that, that's one aspect. The, uh, the other aspect is that if there's a tamsil between the first and the last, then there could be many tamsilat of everything in the middle. Okay. Uh, that's one aspect. The other thing is the ulama of the past did this. Not necessarily in the way that we're going to do it. But for example, Dr. Sarahim Ali has a book called Ali in the Tamsil of Isa, Isa ibn Maryam. The similarities between Ali radiallahu anh and Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. So, um, okay. So with that, just mentioning that it's there in our tradition, this type of thing. And it'll become, I think, even more clear as we talk about and this unfolds, right? Okay. Inshallah. And in a sense, this is an Islamic philosophy of history or the Quranic philosophy of history mm -hmm. what we're discussing. Uh, okay, anyway. So uh, how does this relate to, uh, because uh, Dugan talks about this a lot, the end of history. I mean, Francis... Kuyama, uh, and I don't want to mean to throw you off again, <laughs> right? So, but um, Francis Fukuyama's idea of the end of history, uh, what is, uh, so, so I want you to keep this in mind if you have any words about that, but let's go on to the subject that you want. But at some point, maybe uh, it might be interesting to look at the Quranic concept of end of history in a sense. Um, Okay, Bismillah. That's exactly what we're moving toward. And inshallah, today will be a big step toward that. Um, I also want to say that this is, um, yes, today is going to be much more substantial for the brothers who had criticisms of us focusing too much on the philosophical side of it. This is an Quran. This is like the an, the biblical Torah, Indil, Quran. This is Wahi directly. So there, th that type of criticism may not be possible today, inshallah. Okay. So beginning with the tamsil between Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sayyidina Musa Alaihi Salam, right? So um, on this, these are the two the two heads of the, the two ummas in the subject to uh, Bani Ibrahim, right? Subject to Bani Ibrahim. And in the hadith, we have this clear sense that there is a tamsil between the two ummas and we're gonna follow in their footsteps, footsteps almost exactly, right? But particularly, I wanna focus on the misal between Sayyidina Ali al Islam and Sayyidina Harun al Islam because we do have this, um, uh, I think it was when they made the hijrah, right? When they made the hijrah and uh, Sayyidina Ali al Islam asked uh, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do I not have a brother or something to that effect? Uh, because the akhwat was being established between the Muhajir and the Ansar. And uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you are my brother in this dunya and the akhirah. And then also, um, I think um, I think it was the Waqiya when, uh, when Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the Ghazwa uh, to Hudaybiyah maybe, he 
love Sayyidina Ali al Islam as his Khalifa in as the head of Medina, right? So Sayyidina Ali al Islam wanted to go to war with Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, the "Are you not in the Battle of Tabuk?" Tabuk. And Tabuk. he Ali uh, uh, behind, and there were some complaints. But then mm-hmm. after Hajj al Wida, the Prophet gave this khutbah, the one that I think you're going to refer to, in which he defends Ali radiallahu anhu. Okay. Well, he said something directly to Sayyidina Ali al-Islam. He said, are you not happy? Uh, when, when Sayyidina Ali complained about being left behind, so he, he said, are you not happy that you're to me like oh. a Harun was to Musa? Right. This is famous hadith. And this is very meaningful. We're going to dive into it. And also there is a misal between uh, Al-Hasanain, Al-Hasan and al Hussein and Shabir and Mushabbir, who are the two sons of Sayyidina Harun alayhi salam. And these two sons of Sayyidina Harun alayhi salam are actually, if you've heard of the idea of Cohen's, so um, in in when they're having this sadish or this conspiracy to destroy Betul Maqdis and restore the, the temple in, in Israel right now. So they're training people from the nasl of Sayyidina Harun alayhi salam to engage in certain ibadat that only the, the Cohen's or the nasl, the imami nasl of Sayyidina Harun al-Islam can engage in these ibadat and they have certain maqsus libas that the that the instructions for which is given in the Torah, I think it's Deuteronomy, you can you can see there's khas libas and they have a khas uh, mansab in, in the ummat of Musa al-Islam and it's very parallel to the mansab of the salat in, in the ummat of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so and I, I, one of the parallels you find between the, the, the nasal of imamat in, in the sons of Sayyidina, well, let me tell you a story in Sayyidina. The way it works is that um, when the, the, the Israelites were in the deserts and they were running around the deserts or they were in the deserts for 40 years, uh, what happened is there were certain ibadat that the sons of Harun al-Islam and Harun al-Islam were supposed to complete. So what happens is they're going in there to do those ibadat and they 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 drank before they went in. They they were drunk when they went in to do these ibadat into the haram of Allah, right? The most muqaddis place. They went into the haram while they were drunk. So the fire that um, comes to consume the ghanimat in the previous ummahs, right? The fire that comes to consume the ghanimat in the previous ummahs came and it, it completely consumed these two sons. Now, these were the two elder sons of Sayyidina Harun al-Islam, right? So Sayyidina Harun al-Islam had two younger sons who were left. And so what happens is that the Kohens or the Imami Nasal of the Yahud comes from these two nasals, right? But they have a very interesting pattern in which that uh, that imami nasal goes. So the older son is obviously the imam, and then the second son is the imam. But then the nasal of the second son beca- has imamat in it, right? And then at the end of the ummah, imamat returns to the sons of the first imam. You understand? Uh, so Sayyidina Isa al-Islam, Sayyidina Yahya al-Islam and their mothers and their fathers, they were in the lineage of the older son, even though Imam Let me just stayed. Summarize what you're saying, right? So from Harun, you have his two sons, the younger ones. And just like so many prophets came from one son, like Ismail, so many, and then just one prophet, Prophet Muhammad came from, uh, sorry, from Ishaq, you had many, many prophets until Isa Islam. then you have from Ismail one prophet prophet Muhammad so you have this kind of like same thing occurring in the lineage of Harun Islam, right and so mm-hmm. I think the Jews they say that uh, if I'm correct um, that the Jews they say that the, you can only be a rabbi if you belong to such and such lineages right and uh, and so then that is very important in their conceptual idea of who's the Messiah when we're talking about the the future, because he will have to establish that I'm from such and such lineage. Anyway, so this is uh, important because I think this is going to play on to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his grandchildren Hassan and Hussein, um, because the same thing is kind of repeating. You can see that. Um, but yes, please uh, continue. So when the also Prophet says, about, uh, Ali, your example to me is like that of Harun to Musa. He doesn't yes. necessarily mean in terms of imamat, in terms of Khalifa, but 
in this specific historical context, over here, I also want to clear something else up, but in this historical context, uh, it's specifically in terms of how history will unfold, uh, right? Since we're talking mm -hmm. about history. And so when the prophet says to Ali, your example, you know go ahead. No, please. So, so, so when Harun has his children and he has, uh, just like Ibrahim has many children from Ishaq who are prophets and leaders, and only one great prophet that comes from Ismail. Okay, so you have the same phenomenon happening amongst Bani Israel itself as a subset from the children of Harun, right? From the two younger sons that survived, mm -hmm. if I'm understanding. Yeah. Yes. And now you're going to say, okay, Ali is like Harun as Harun was to Prophet Musa. Uh, prophet Muhammad is like Musa, and the Prophet said to Ali, "You're like my Harun." Right. Yes. So in a sense, the prophet is giving himself the tashbih, I am Musa and you're Harun. Right. By calling yes. Ali radiallahu uh, anh Harun, he means that I'm Musa in terms of the ummah. Yep. Right. And so there's something similar between Prophet Muhammad and uh, Ali that is also similar between Prophet Muhammad uh, sorry, Prophet Musa and Harun, right? And since Harun died before Musa, it's not th for the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, and, but it actually has to do with the other end of history, you can say, um, which is interesting. Um, okay, so I, if you want to add something to that, just you can, okay. otherwise, let's continue. Okay. Well, uh, Sayyidina, we know when Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaks, he speaks the, in the truest way, right? So there's this famous hadith where he makes a joke with a sahabi that he loved. He goes up behind him in the marketplace and holds him, hugs him very hard, and then pulls him up into the air. And he, he says, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who will buy this slave for me? Who will buy this slave for me? And the Sahaba, he's struggling when he doesn't know who it is. But when he hears uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's voice, he relaxes into the he relaxes into Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he says, "Ya Rasulullah, you will not find uh, a a big price for me. No one will pay that much for me." And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responds, um, "But with Allah, you have a great price." Meaning in, in the eyes of Allah, you have a great price, you know. Um, so when when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is even joking, he has this truth in the way he's joking, right? So when he says to Sayyidina Ali, you are to me uh, the mithal of what Harun was to Musa, that is very meaningful. It is as perfectly true as is possible. Uh, it, is, it is true on an existential vajiti level, you know, it's like very, you know, substantially true. And then secondly, um, I had one more thing. Oh, also, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says about al hasanan these are my sons, right, he calls them his sons, like this son, he, one time in one hadith he says, Hussein is the son of Ali and Hassan is my son. And other times he says, this son of mine will be a Sayyid. Right? So he calls him his son, right? And so when Rasulullah, and, and then in Sharia, the, there's um, ijma between both Shia and Sunni on this, that the, the Sadat are in terms of Sharia, not in a biological way, to, in terms of Sharia to be subscribed to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Sayyidina Hassan was called Ibn Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's not meant in a biological way, but there's some truth to that. I won't get into the particulars of it here, but there's some truth to that, right? So um, going back to- some truth uh, Because from a Sharia perspective, right? From a Sharia perspective, yeah. the prophet has no lineage in a sense because all his, you know, uh, boys, uh, passed away and so uh, you're not the father of any of them right amongst the men but there is this kind of like spiritual uh, you can say lineage uh, that's that it, some people consider it actually a part of the sharia meaning part of the legality of islam and other people may not consider it part of the legality of islam but again, when the Prophet is saying to Musa, uh, Ali, you are like Harun to me, 
is that does that establish a legal bond in a sense uh, amongst other events in the in the story of the prophet and ali so i'm just saying that just so that you know if people are like oh wait but the prophet had only girls well here is one thing to consider that the prophet actually made this kind of like relationship between him and ali uh radiyallahu an and sallallahu alaihi wasallam so uh okay so ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam and please continue now okay. so uh, just because we kind of wound up a little bit here i i'll share one thing the hadith that i shared when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says i am the sayyid of bani adam and that there's not a uh, fakar in that right i'm not being boastful it's just the truth right and that that there's a tasbi between sayyid bani adam and imam an-nas right because in the quran there's three istilahat for bani adam there's bani adam which has the most karam there's bashar which also has some karam but not as much and then there's insan and in, insan is a uh, hakir a little bit you know it's a uh, it's lowly when allah sp- speaks about insan and so when Im- imam an-nas and imam and sayyid are also similar terminologies like imam means the one you put in front of you and um because allah uses this for the way also right like a, a road can also be called the imam in the quran and then sayyid is actually the term that a, a slave used to use for his master um in in before shariat or before deen and then in the sunnah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that some certain point no uh, i'm sorry rab is the word that used to be used by a slave for his master and then in the sunnah it was revealed at some point no don't call uh, your master rab that is only for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now but call them sayyid right so the, 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 it's the same term that an abd uses for his rab and i think in my my theology it is the most difference that can exist between two human beings is between an abid and a sayyid beyond that there's no other that's the most difference that can exist between two people so when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says this son of mine will be a sayyid right? this son of mine will be a sayyid this is for me now that i am also a sayyid so i may be a little bit uh, biased in this um but it is also an experiential and existential truth of mine that there is a sayyid fitra right there is a fitra that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had and the more qurb you have him in terms of uh, qurb mustafa the more qurb mustafa you have the more istifat you have right so banu hashim has more istifat than quraish quraish has more istifat than uh, banu ismail banu ismail has more istifat than um bani banu isaq and then uh, bani ibrahim has more istifat than the rest of bani adam right so th- this is a haqiqa in our deen and i think it, the more, that when you have the sadat there is some metaphysical reality where they have they have inherited on, not on a biological level but on a metaphysical level a more access to the fitra of sayyidna muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam exceptionally i don't want to get into the detailed theology of that here but there is this exceptional inheritance and so they have this potential when they are muttaqi and they follow the sunna uh, they have much more ability to be mazhar of nur muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam than others and if you look at the indian subcontinent right um right you had sayyid uh, what was sayyid um, ahmed brelvi sahab and then you have uh, sayyid alam modudi and then you have you know uh, sayyid sulman hussain and nadwi and you have sayyid jawad naqwi and so i do think the revival process of the umma it is in the sadat right i do believe that that the upward movement coming and i know this is different from traditional sunnism and maybe from you but i just wanted to put it out there and um i do have one last piece that i want to share about shabir and mushabbir and al hasanain but i'll stop there and give you maybe if you want to respond to something okay um so talking about the tashbih of prophet muhammad and musa um first of all they both had a book right and the prophet has one book because he's the last prophet but it is from musa that the other books come meaning from taurat you get zabur and then injil is from uh, prophet isa and uh, and again uh, when isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes down according to some of the verses he's going to know all of this he already knows the taurat he already knows the zabur he knows the injil and he's going to know the quran so it's like this is part of 
you can say the unfolding of history. But uh, the second thing is that they both have an ummah, right? And the Prophet said that my ummah will go through whatever the previous ummah, meaning the ummah of Bani Israel went through, my ummah will go through. So meaning we have very similar histories, even to the point of saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all, all the, the similarity between the two ummas of Musa and my ummah is like two shoes, uh, the two shoes of a, a pair of shoes, right? So there may be some slight differences, but overall it's very similar. Then you also find, for example, when it came to Sharia specifically. So over here, I also want to make another distinction that's important, is that. When we're talking specifically right now, we're talking about how we're talking about Prophet Muhammad and Musa and similarities specifically from the perspective of how history is unfolding. Because from another perspective, Prophet Muhammad has all the qualities of all the prophets previously. So like, for example, the Sharia of Musa, والسلام, he has that, but he also has the Ruhaniyat or the, the spiritual aspect of Isa. So in other words, the beauty of Yusuf. So we can talk about these issues but over here we're talking specifically as history is going to unfold so in that perspective the personality of Musa is most important to the Prophet and it is not by chance then when he went to Miraj and he was coming down it was Musa he met who kept sending him back up for the prayers and saying your ummah cannot do this your ummah cannot do this right and it is uh you know, the prophet wakes up from a dream and says, I saw a very large ummah. And he thought it was his, but it was actually Musa. Uh, the prophet says on the day of judgment, I don't know who will be awakened first, me or Musa, for example. Meaning that's how similar they are in some uh, aspects, in some ways. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, the word of Allah is put into the mouth of Musa. The word of Allah is put into the mouth of uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but in some ways they complement. He's Jalali and she, he's Jamali. Like he, the Prophet shows the beauty and the rahma, and Prophet Musa is, uh, has, you can say, anger. A type of, you know, um, I don't know what the right word. Anger may not be the right word, but he has awe and power, right? And uh, so, so they also have this complementary. And uh, Musa has followers. And Musa has a Fir'aun, and Prophet Muhammad has a Fir'aun, Abu Jahl, which he, Abu Lahab, he mentioned is the Fir'aun of my Ummah. So uh, Prophet Musa has successors. Prophet Muhammad has successors, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, uh, you know, Prophet Musa, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, uh, has done Hijrah. Prophet Muhammad does Hijrah. Prophet Musa tries to go to jihad. Prophet Muhammad's people go to jihad. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has a natural passing away. Musa alayhi salatu wasallam has a natural passing away. Unlike, like for example, Isa, right? So where it's a little bit mysterious, and we can get into that, but it's not the way the two passed away. Um, uh, and so, Prophet Musa gets married before his nubuwa. Uh, Prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu gets married before his nubuwa. And in fact, uh, according to the Bible, Deuteronomy, uh, there one, there's one passage that says, you know, from your cousins who will be uh, given this, the word of God would be put into, the, into, the, into your cousins. Uh, and he will, you know, and, and so again, this kind of like similarity between Prophet Musa. So even in the Bible, when they say, uh, they will know him like they know their own children. One of the um, verses seems to point between the similarities between Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Musa as a movement, as an unfolding of history. Right, that they both leave a book behind, they both leave an ummah behind, they both, you know, like this. There are slight differences also, of course, because initially they didn't uh, go with what Musa wanted. It took them a while to get into the jihad phase under Daud and in the case of the Prophet, that didn't happen. And notice over there also, when the Prophet said uh, in the Battle of Badr, when he was looking for advice, what should we do? 
because Allah has promised us one of the two groups, either Abu Sufyan's uh, caravan, we can get the money, or we can fight the war with the Quraysh and win. And their response was, we're not like Bani Israel, you know, we're not like the people of Musa. So they're also like, even the Sahaba were making this uh, comparison, and the Quran does too, uh, where the Quran says, for example, um, uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, uh, Allah says, um, Allah says, do you want to ask questions to Prophet Muhammad like Musa was asked questions? Right? So this also the Sharia aspect, like don't ask Prophet Muhammad, like the whole other having respect for the Prophet is compared with Prophet Musa in the Quran. Like, don't be like to Musa where his people were rude to him. As Prophet Musa says, why do you pain me? Right? And, and so the Sahaba were like, no, we're not going to be like the people of Musa. So anyway, I was only establishing here that there does seem to be, when you, and I'm sure if we dig deeper, we can just have a whole episode just showing the relationship between Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and Musa alayhi particularly from the perspective of the ummah, the two ummahs, like Prophet Muhammad's uh, ummah, this ummah that we're in, and the previous ummah before this, the former Muslim ummah, as Dr. Israel used to call it, the four previous, the ummah Bani Israel. This is why it's so important, because when the Quran is talking about Bani Israel, the whole Quran is almost talking about Bani Israel when it talks about prophets, other than a few prophets, right? Like Prophet Saleh, Prophet Shu'aib, uh, Prophet Hud, uh, maybe one more prophet. The rest of it is all Bani Israel. There's this former Muslim Ummah that's being set as an example. And the prophet said, you will follow the Jews, meaning Bani Israel, like Shibran uh, uh, hands band by hands band. And if one of them goes into a lizard's hole, you'll go into the lizard's hole, right? And so today we're in the lizard's hole. And so, uh, and then uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, for example, another just example of similitude of Musa and Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet says, uh, The ulama, the true scholars of my ummah will be like the prophets of Bani Israel. So anyway, so there is this strong relationship between the personality of Prophet Musa and personality of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as leaders of an ummah uh, and how this unfolds in, in the history within the ummahs. So I just wanted to add that to further and, and establish listen, what you're saying. Yes, and, and listening to you, um, you shared a hadith that I would like to maybe share fully. You just mentioned it in passing. And there's these two events of the Miraj that also came to mind while you're speaking about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Musa Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, so the first one might be a Sufi story or it might be a say hadith. I'm not sure. So just take it, it, take it with a grain of salt, but there's a lesson in it. There's a sabak. So take it lightly. Uh, there was this story where when uh, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the Uruj, he, he passed by some place and he heard this voice and the voice was being very rough it was speaking very roughly and strongly and very you know intensely you know and rageful,ly maybe and Rasulullah asked Hazrat Jibreel who is this and he said uh, it's Musa al-Islam and he says who is this he speaking the narration? I don't know the authentic narration but the narration is there sure Okay. Yes, I read it myself. So he's speaking to Allah, yeah. and so uh, he says, uh, and Allah, and so uh, uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam questions his behavior because obviously it's against the disposition of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be this way, especially with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So as Jibril says, um, Allah created Musa; He doesn't mind Musa. Hmm. You know, and uh, I just found that so beautiful. I don't know what it is exactly. Like you said, the Rabbi is there, but I, I just always found that very beautiful. Yeah, and also, and I think it does a good... the first person he sees is Musa. When he's going on the Isra, he sees Musa praying in his grave. Mm -hmm. 
And the last person he sees before coming down is Musa. But of course, there's difference of opinions, but this is one valid opinion. So he saw all the prophets going up, but on the way down, the last person he sees is Musa, who kept telling him, go back to Allah and you know, negotiate the prayers. So the first prophet he and sees... Even, and even in that, in that, you see the difference in disposition where Musa al-Islam is very rigorous. And he's like, your ummah will not be able to fulfill this. You know, your ummah, and he, he's very strict like that. And Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has more haya, where he, he's taking the nasiyah of Sayyidina Musa al -Islam. He, he has the same practicality where he understands he has to make it easy as possible for his ummah, right? And he, so, so he takes the advice a few times and Hazrat Jibril, you know, uh, advises that he take the advice. But uh, ultimately, it is not Sayyidina Musa al-Islam who feels too much haya. It's Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who feels too much haya to go back. And it is in response to that haya of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that the voice comes. It's like, no, this is it. You know, this, it, so the, the, shar, the sharia of Allah or the hukum of Allah is after the fitra of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa or his disposition, not after the fitra of Sayyidina Musa al-Islam. Hmm. So that, that is the second one. And then you mentioned a hadith. If you'll permit me, I'd like to I'd like to just mention the hadith. Yeah. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay. So th that hadith that you mentioned was that one time there was a um, there was a Jewish person in Medina and, and a Sahabi, and they were they were having a conflict of some kind, and the Jewish person um, uh, asserted the superiority of Sayyidina Musa over Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Obviously, as a Jewish person, he would do that. So the Sahabi got angry and he hit him. Right. So the Jewish person went to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, "Why am I being hit?" Right? Why am I being hit? And um, so after Rasulullah heard the case, he says uh, to the Sahabi, don't make me, don't do takbir of me or don't make me greater than Musa because on the day of resurrection, I've been, uh, I will be raised and I will see Sayyidina Musa -Islam holding on to the arsh of Allah. And I don't know if he will be raised before me or if he will not have, you know, he will not have, uh, passed away or whatever so um so don't prioritize me over him so that you mentioned that hadith in passing and i thought it was a good moment to to share it yeah and uh and over here is you know we learned something very important from the prophet وسلم, that obviously we feel very strongly the prophet is the uh the most superior of all the prophets uh ultimately right uh but when you're doing that one, that's not like you're when you're doing that one, you have to have the wisdom to know uh, what uh, like so in this case, for example, the prophet is doing that one, and you saying no, there's no difference for it because you have to understand the basic principles first before you go into the spiritual because it's in the spiritual realm where we can talk about who has a higher rank than others. Uh, but in the Sharia, from a Sharia point of view, they are all equal in a sense, right? Um, particularly the Rasuls. But uh, again, we can have a discussion on that. But uh, yeah, so he, that was the example the Prophet said. I don't know if it's me or Musa. He's comparing himself to Musa. And the, the reason he's specifically comparing himself to Musa والسلام, rather than the Prophet is because he's referring to himself as a leader of an ummah, right? That he as a leader of an ummah of a people and me because these are the two largest ummahs you can say right so you have ibrahim and then ibrahim has uh two sons and you have a great ummah under musa, uh, musa all the prophets you know basically and uh and then you have prophet uh, is, uh prophet ismail from ismail you have prophet muhammad another big ummah and so these two ummahs have a lot of similarities and so, uh, anyway, okay, so let's continue, inshallah. Continue. Okay, um, uh, one last thing on Al-Hasnain, and you may know this hadith, and this is a, like, I heard this from a, a hadith scholar, you know, so it's a very, um, it's about Al-Hasnain, but it's a very, I don't know the exact uh, source of it, but it's like uh, Majid al-Rabit is a very strong Ahle Hadith Majid in San Diego, and that's where I kind of heard it. And it's uh, basically, um, the names of uh, uh, al-Hasanain 
uh, are either the same meaning or on the same vazan as the names of the two sons of of, uh, of Harun al Islam, right? And so on this basis, we also see that not only Sayyidina Ali having the same role in the Ummah that Sayyidina Harun al Islam had, but that um, Al Hassanain also had the same role that the two sons of Sayyidina Harun al Islam had. And then we know that in, in the Jewish Sharia, Deuteronomy, almost all of Deuteronomy is about imamat, right? It's about priesthood. So if we translate uh, the imamat to English, they say uh, the covenant of priesthood, right? So the, the real translation in my mind, I agree with this tarjuma, is priesthood is the best translation for the Quranic usage of the word imama, right? Like the imamat is covenant of priesthood. Interesting. So the, in, in the Sharia of Musa al-Islam, the descendants of the two sons of Harun al-Islam are Cohen's. And for me, the Sadat, the sons of al Hasanain, have the exact same muqam in Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the, the sons of Harun al-Islam have in the Sharia of, um, uh, of Musa al-Islam. And this includes things like, um, and this is where we start resolving Shia Sunni debates, right? A little bit in the light of biblical history, um, is that, um, the idea of homes also, right? In English, you, you live in America, I'm from America, so you know that there's this idea of tithing, right? You're familiar with the idea of tithing in Christianity. Mm -hmm. Where does that idea come from? It comes from the tithe that was paid to the sons of Sayyidina Harun al Islam, right? Mm -hmm. That's where that idea comes from. And homes is very similar. It's a very similar uh, idea. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything on that. Yeah, so... Um... That and then also like uh, in terms of Hassan and Hussein, kind of like uh, alayhi salatu wasalam, ha them having like a special or a unique position within the ummah. Uh, you know, you also have free or, or the Ahlul Bayt in general, right? So there's no, they don't receive zakat. So the Prophet said no zakat for them. Um, but they can get gifts. You can give gifts or some, somebody's from the family of the Prophet they can't you can't give them zakat but you can give them a gift or you can give them uh um, anyway so you get the point so there is oh, one one just one thing really quickly there uh, those type of special ahkamat for one nasab or one nasal is also that's the um what's it, that's an ayat of uh, imamat, right? When you have special hukum or special ahkamat for a particular nasal, that is that is imamat. That's exactly because that, you have particular ahkamat for the nasab of Sayyidina Harun al Islam, and you have particular ahkamat for Sadat, and you don't have that for anybody else, right? So that that is exactly imamat. And the second thing is when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam loves, you know, the the shoulder meat. You know what I'm talking about, brother? Like the sunnah is to love the shoulder meat. That's because because in the Sharia de Musi, the shoulder of every animal that was sacrificed or made qurban would go to the Imam Nasr. It, it's a sign of Imamat. Hmm. And one last thing, uh, just to relate this, you know, Bibi Safiya, uh, the, the Zoja of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Jewish Zoja, she was actually from a Kohen lineage also. She was also a Kohaness. So, uh, okay, so let me delve into two things as we talk about the unfolding of history, right? So the first is, does Fatima, radiallahu anha, does she have a special position amongst the other daughters of the Prophet? Number one. I, I think, yes. And so one answer to that is that because she became, or Khatija became impregnant, impregnated, impregnated, with Fatima during the Prophet's prophethood, whereas the other daughters did not get uh, did not get conception. They weren't uh, uh, before. They all got uh, uh, born before the prophethood, whereas Fatima got conceived in the prophethood. And I've heard a lot of debates if it's true or not true. I've heard so many wayats that show that it's true. Um, and and I've heard, meaning I haven't looked into it myself. I haven't dug on the issue, but it's an interesting uh, point. Uh, what do you have any comments on that? And the second, yeah, 
in my theology, I would love for that to be true, brother. Like, I, I don't know if it is or not. So I have at the out, but I would, it would confirm my way of looking at things because I do believe in the Isma or the perfection of Sayyidina Fatima al-Islam in a particular way. And also, um, um, even if it's not true, even if it's not true, the, what is true, what makes her exceptional is she had, she was in Bet on Nabua during her Halim Ismat, right? When she was a child, when she was Masum, she had that time in Betul Nabua. So that is also a big barakah. That is also a sabab toward tahara or perfect tahara. Because the salam of Allah was not only on Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was also on Sayyidina Khadija Radian Alayhi Salam. You, do you yeah. know that hadith? There's a say hadith yeah, where... That's uh, authentic, yes, yes. Yes, so, that that you know, uh, Hazrat Jibril came to um, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "Allah sends His salam on Khadija, and I I therefore send my salam on Khadija. So you also send your salam on Khadija, uh, alayhi salam. So so Sayyidina Khadija also had this salam, you know, on her. And when you have that hadith where there's the four women, there's all, there's many men who perfected their iman, but only four women who did that. And of them is Sayyidina Khadija, uh, Sayyidina." Fatma al-Islam, Sayyidina Maryam al-Islam, and say, uh, what's her name? Asiya. Sayyidina Asiya. So the Asiya. two family of the Prophet, right? Khatija and Fatima yes. are amongst the four women, right? And so, uh, so, yes. so, so that's like very interesting. And then, of course, Fatima is the only child of the Prophet that continues to live after the Prophet just for a short while, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the Prophet's the one that tells her, you're going to pass away in six months after I leave. And she was completely fine with that. Uh, so, uh, okay. So th in that sense, uh, we see that, for example, Ali radiallahu anh, had many children from even other wives after. He didn't marry anybody else while he was married to Fatima. Mm -hmm. And the Prophet did not marry anybody else while he was married to Khatija. Mm -hmm. Now, one could technically say that you know you're just making links that are arbitrary and they just happen to come together in a neat way uh, maybe yeah you can make the argument right but ooh, in the way that we're going to unfold history the way that we're looking at it it makes sense within the it's not the it's not the overarching it's a sub it's a sub point within a, a bigger point and it fits within itself and as well as within the the bigger point as as history unfolds so that it's not just uh, an interesting coincidence but it also fits the bigger macro picture of, of history itself and so um okay allahumma salli ala muhammad i think this is very significant for because let's let's talk about something very important here i think and that is that that the sunnis in reaction to the Shi'i, uh, we have not given the value of Ahlul Bayt to Ahlul Bayt. Sometimes it's an allergic reaction, right? And so I think it's very important that we revive that within the Sunni tradition. Because for us, you know, for, for the Shi'i, I can see, you know, it's a little bit harder because for them, to accept Aisha and all the companions and Abu Bakr and Umar can be hard for many Shia. But for us, the Sunnis, it's absolutely no problem accepting Zain and Abidin. I don't know why we don't read his du'as and his literature and uh, what he has to offer. Uh, I think it's very spiritual. And uh, because of that, some of the Shia people have a certain advantage. We don't because we're not using what is ours in a sense. And no, I'm not even saying this as a Sunni. I'm just saying this as a Muslim. Okay, um, and so um, the uh, the 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 Ahlul Bayt, their legacy, in terms of, and and what's really important for me is that the legacy of the Khilafa, right? They were the last stand, meaning Hussein tried to make it right in a passive way, and then uh, sorry Hassan made it good in a passive way okay let's unite everyone and uh, and then hussein did it in a more active way but if it wasn't for hassan and hussein or if it wasn't specifically for hussein standing up against the 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 uh, i don't want to say 
uh, you know, I don't know what word, but against the people that were trying to change Islam. If he hadn't stood up, it would have been very hard for even a scholar to look back in history and try to resolve a lot of issues. His standing up uh, became and has become uh, an archetype, a symbol that can that makes that clear distinction between malukiyat, or you can say kingship, and khilafat rashida. And his standing up is, I think, very, uh, a very, very important. It wasn't just uh, Hussein, also the, the grandson of Abu Bakr, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and the two of them together. I think that if that had not happened in history, we, we as Muslims would be very confused, like about the political system and who should have, it, like, where's right and where's wrong. It would be a lot more. I think we're pretty confused regardless. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a lot more clear to me after, you know, um, yeah. after those events. Huh? You know. I understand what you're saying. I was just joking. No, no, no. I no, I get what you're saying. It's still confusing. It's true because you still have people all over the place on the, on these issues, but um, but I think um, again, the number one that I do want to emphasize this is that the place of Ahlul Bayt needs to be restored within the Sunni tradition. Number one, and number two, uh, the uh, this is directly connected to this. The idea of khilafa needs to be restored. Uh, the idea of the one ummah has to be restored within the, the ummah. And preferably uh, somebody from the family of the Prophet. If not, it could be a Quraishite, according to like the Shafi'i fiqh, you can say. But there should be a khalifa. And this is what uh, the family of the Prophet uh, fought for. And the other thing that is very interesting is, you know, everyone knows the hadith. The Prophet said that you can find guidance in the Quran and my sunnah. Right? And the Prophet said, Alaykum sunnati wa sunnatul khulafa rashidin al mahdiyin. Hold on one second. Let me just. Uh, uh, so, me and my khulafa. But there's another tradition that says, uh, the itri, my family. Right, so you can find guidance in my family. So this again, Hassan and Hussein become very important. The concept of Mahdi becomes very important. So, you know, people that deny the coming of Mahdi, uh, but there's also other narrations that point to this idea of the family of the Prophet uh, being a source of guidance, right? And so, um, yeah. So this May is I just one one thing here. Uh, Sheikh Albani actually, Sheikh Albani, he says that um, Hadith Thakalain, which is the Hadith you're referring to, is the most mutawatir, the most Sahih Hadith of all the Hadith. Yeah. So the family of the Prophet is going to play, inshallah, a big role in the coming of times, and it's only the family of the Prophet that can combine the Sunni Shia difference in a sense. Yep. Because you have the love yeah. of Bayt but you also have the Sunni uh, aspect, right? So it's, it's, it's like, it's almost, it's a need at this point. Mm -hmm. You must, we must have somebody from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu that kind of like bridges this gap. Um, and I think not just, not just one person, which will be Imam al-Mahdi obviously, but it is a general uh, adab and a general restoration of the Sadat to their proper maqam within the Ummah. Uh, second to the Quran. So Dr. Sar and you and I as students of Dr. Sar really emphasize restoring the Quran to its proper muqam in the Ummah, right? That that's but that is impossible without at the same time restoring the Ahlul Bayt and the Itra and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to both of those things must be done at once. They cannot really be separated from each other. They, they can only be done at once. You cannot give the Quran its proper hakuk without giving the Ahlul Bayt their proper hakuk. And and just one thing, um, um, going back to um, the 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 hadith we were talking about, I forgot to mention one thing about the four women. If you look at two of those women, uh, so like Maryam al Islam, uh, who received the tajalli of Allah subhanahu wa taala in her hand. So she's clearly alayhi salam. And then we have the say hadith about Sayyidina Khatija alayhi salam being alayhi salam, having the salam of Allah, having the salam of Hazrat Jibreel, having the salam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the other two women, when we say 
what does it mean to that these women perfected their iman, right? So they were the type of women, if uh, forgive me for this example, but they were the type of women, if they were female nabis, these were the women that would be selected. You know, they had that tahara, takmili tahara. I don't, you, you understand what I'm saying? Maybe it's not the best way to say it, but I, I, that's just what came to mind, right? So they had this takmili tahara, they had this salam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the dunya upon them. Right, so this is also when we get to the Muslim history, we will understand that Sayyidina Fatima alayhi salam, and I think most Sunni scholars agree that to this is Afzal over all the Sahaba. Right, Sayyidina Fatima alayhi salam is Afzal. She has Tafzil over the rest of the Sahaba or any anybody else of the uh, of Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam's generation. So what this means is she is Tahir. She has Mukammal Tahara, just like Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam had Mukammal Tahara or she could take the tajalli of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in her rahim. Sayyidina Khatija al-Islam had the same tahara. Sayyidina Fatima al-Islam had the same tahara. And Sayyidina uh, Asiya had the same tahara. And they had different azbab and sabab to the tahara that they achieved. But they, they, they still had this uh, mukammal tahara. Right. And so, okay, so we've established Prophet Musa and Prophet Muhammad as it unfolds in history specifically and then prophet uh harun and ali radiallahu an as they're unfolding in history okay so where do we go from here and at okay. some point maybe i do want to talk about the similarities of the ummah also in terms of how it's like amazing the history how they similar they have been up till this point you know um so maybe i will i think that'll like add to the overall exfoliating of how history exfoliated itself i think uh, in my sequence in my mind right now the next step is to begin the discussion between the tasbi between say uh, millat ibrahim and um uh, Ummat Musa, which is encapsulated in the du Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid. Like that, that, we can go into that. But I feel that the discussion that you just mentioned about the tasbih between the two ummas, this might be a good moment if, you, if you're prepared to do that. Yeah, yeah. Because I know... I make it very simple. And then we'll see where it goes from there, inshallah, based upon the time that we have. And then we we'll have to continue tomorrow but uh so we have two ummas that have very similar histories and so when for example in Sutul, uh, bani israel which is right before Sutul kahaf in the twin surahs right a lot goes through the basically the entire history of bani israel within like three four verses of the quran so begins with musa they have their first rise with daud Talut, Daud, and then Suleiman their first rise. We have our first rise with the Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Umar, so on and so forth. Then there's a downfall, just like it happened with us, there was a downfall. Then, then from the north, the Assyrians attacked Bani Israel. For us, the Crusaders attacked from the north. And then the Babylonians attacked from the east for Bani Israel. And for us, the Tatars attacked from the east. Then there's another rise in Bani Israel under Uzair which leads to the Maccabi power. Then we also have another, starting with Salahuddin Ayyubi. Uh, and, uh, you know, Salahuddin Ayyubi gives us the second rise, which leads ultimately to the Ottoman. <laughs> then there's a new, another decline in Bani Israel, and same to, is, is and and that is followed by the uh, the Greeks or the Romans uh, taking over the Muslim world of that time, and by that time most of the priesthood and most of the ulama of Bani Israel. By the word ulama is used in Quran twice, and one of them is ulama u Bani Israel. In the Quran says the ulama of Bani Israel, they had completely been you can say deceived or uh, were on the side of the, uh, the, 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 the Roman Empire. They were basically bought out, uh, ulama. And they're the ones that were against Isa, but again, Western hegemony, Western, um, uh, you can say, um, what is it called? Uh, 
uh, you know, the, this kind of like, uh, the, I'm looking for a specific philosophical word that basically means going after pleasure. I mean, it's a very common word, but hedonism. Uh, hedonism, there you go. So like this hedonism, you know, Western dominance. So this happens in Bani Israel and has now happened with us. And it is in this phase where the, uh, the hedonism and the, the, you can say the new Rome, uh, kind of the Western side of Rome has taken over the Muslim Ummah. And uh, it is in this situation that Isa and Islam is uh, likely to come down. So there's this kind of like whole history of our rise and their rise and their fall and our fall and then their second rise and our second rise with the Ottomans and then their fall. And now we're ending in the same uh, place in regards to our attitudes, uh, our, um, you know, losing the, oh, and that's what Isa alayhi salatu salam kind of did. He is like over, he was very critical of their uh, legal uh, interpretations. And he was very critical of, they're um, not looking at the spirit of things, and he was very critical. Fake legalism. And they're le yeah, it, it even went to the point of fake legalisms, um, and then more than that, what people don't realize about Isa is not the Islam, which is mentioned in the Saf, and Alhamdulillah, Allah opened some aspects of history to me where it became even more clear, where Allah says, "فَأَمَنَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِنْ بَنِي إسْرَائِيلَ وَكَفَرَ الطَّائِفَةُ." We found Isa and his people superior. So what happened is there came a point that Isa alayhi salatu salam, he came with 10,000 people into Jerusalem, took over the city, meaning no more Roman rule, took over the city, threw away the den of the thieves because the temple was the center of the city. And he even, it, it, there's a lot more to this, obviously, you can unpack this a lot. But he basically took control of the city. <coughs> it was at that point that the Romans said, okay, we need to get him. It was at that point the ulama felt like, okay, our authority has been thrown away and we need to get him. And it was at this point that they wanted to capture him. That when they felt, okay, now he's, because remember, Zakaria was in the temple. And then Zakaria was killed. And Harun was never in the temple. He wasn't allowed in the temple. The ulama had taken over. And then they killed Harun. And now they were after Isa. Because they were the only threats left to that Khilafah. To the restoration of Khilafah. Which is what we're talking about. Like This is the end of Bani Israel's history. And it has to do with Khilafah. Right? And, and, and we're, we're dealing with the same issue in our ummah in the end period. In the end of times. Mm -hmm. So there, there's, there's that similarity too. Um, so, yeah, so they didn't like uh, Isa alayhi salatu salam taking over. So when, he, when they tried to kill him and he left, but the leadership continued. And the leadership was given to a man named Ishaq. He's known as uh, James, the brother of Jesus. I don't know if you ever heard James, the brother of Jesus. He was actually the leader of the, the Christians of that time. They were Jews, but they were believers of Isa. And then they killed and him. And they were the most because they had the kitab and the hikmah, right? Right. So, As opposed to Pauline, Pauline idealism. Right. So, so that ha happened, uh, you know, sometime after. So, yes. Okay. So. Okay, so that's, in the nutshell, rise, fall, rise, fall with Bani Israel. And then the rise, yep. fall, rise, fall with our Ummah. And now we're at this low ebb, right? And continuing to yeah, go so, down. Yep. So, so I have this impulse that I'm listening to. I remember all this. I'm a student of Dr. Sar, and I love that you know, you are also to, you know, I think at this point in our conversation, you can see that I'm a student of Dr. Sar. Like I said, I asserted that before, but I think we, we see each other now more fully. And, um, but you can also see that our, our relationship is slightly different, right? Like, um, we're like, of course, right? Everyone is individual and unique. And um, for me, I, I think I've taken on the deeper impulse of Dr. Sar, and I'm not as attached to his particular, like his particular 
things, right? Like what you just described is where I began like 10 years ago. And one criticism I have of that perspective that you just offered is one, it's Sunni dominant, right? So the whole analysis of our compare, and it's also Jewish dominant. So on that side, you're looking at only Jewish history and you're not looking at the history of Nasara also, which is also the ummah of uh, Sayyidina Musa Islam, right? Because Sayyidina Isa is not a new ummah, he is the last Nabi in the ummah of Musa alayhi salam. So the, the, the followers of Isa alayhi salam, especially the Jewish ones, are still in the ummah of Musa. So you look, you have to look at the dialectic between uh, Yehud and Nasara within in the in in the history of the ummah of the Yehud. You know, you know what I'm saying? The ummah yeah, of Musa. Secondly. On this side, um, you're looking at it from like the Khulafa and the Uthmani, uh, you know, Sultanat and all. You're looking at it from a Sunni dominant perspective, whereas I, I'm more respectful where like I want to be more inclusive, right? So when I, I do my analysis of history, when we get to the dialectics of Muslim history, which is talking about the same subject matter, but with a slightly different opinion, it's that um, I I give the vazan of the Yehud and the Kitab to the Sunnis and I, to some degree, there's more nuance to this, and I give the wazan of the hikmah and the nasara to the to the Shia, and then my analysis proceeds from that point. But it's based on the same hadith, so we'll get to that, inshallah. I don't think we should start the discussion on the the missile of Ibrahim. You look you look tired, brother. I'm sorry. If this no, no, no. I'm I'm fine. Alhamdulillah. Uh, but yeah, so let's uh, do a session tomorrow on continuing from right here. So today, what did we accomplish? We accomplished the relationship between. Prophet Muhammad and Musa, Prophet uh, uh, Prophet Harun and Ali, right? And a little bit of a historical context of the similarities. So this, what does this have to do with history and end of history? Well, if they're similar, then you already have a template of one ummah, right? Now that will give you an idea of the template of the this ummah as it has been so far, as well as what's in the future. One thing I wanted to mention, uh, if you have any comments, please do mention that, that uh, Al-Aqsa was taken from the history of Bani Israel twice, right? The, the, the second fall. So we were, so far, Aqsa was taken from us once, and then Salahuddin Ayyubi got it back. And because the Quran mentions this specifically, the taking away of their city of Jerusalem, uh, twice, there's a big possibility at some point Al-Aqsa will be taken away from the hands of the Muslims. So uh, I don't know if you have a comment on that, but. Uh... Um, I don't have a clear comment. I do believe uh, just generally related that they will take it and that they will build the Betul Maqdas in the Jewish way the third time and that the Jal will do certain things there. And I, I maybe I mentioned this before they're preparing. I do think they're gonna successfully destroy Allah. I think that's going to happen at some point and it will be right before the Dajjal comes. Maybe that's generally related to what you're saying. Okay, so let's end here. And so tomorrow we're gonna to discuss uh, what? We will discuss the misal between Sayyidina uh, Ibrahim al Islam and Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Milad okay. Ibrahim. Okay. So now we're yeah. So we're looking at the other frame. So one framework is from Musa to Isa, and from Prophet Muhammad to Isa is one frame. Now we're looking at the relationship between Prophet Muhammad because they're also very similar, right? So Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the similarity between these two, and how that that plays out in all of this. Okay. Jazakumullah khairan inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah